And um, I want to introduce Amy Rogi, who is a physician assistant, head and neck at Spectrum. And she um, uh, is joined by Melody Harvey. Amy is, uh, has been passionate passionate about ways to mitigate climate change since she was living in Seattle and there was a horrible fire season and people kept coming to the ER because they were breathing toxins. Um, and that essentially, as she describes it, ignited a firestorm in her and she's been active ever since. She's one of our most active MICA members, but she also started the Michigan Electric Vehicle Alliance or MEVA in early 2021. And Melody is the secretary and an active volunteer of MEVA. And she's a passionate volunteer because she wants to create a better future for all of us. Um, She's done a lot in terms of speaking to legislatures and speaking publicly um, and like she is today. So she hopes that we can reach MEVA's goal of 100% EVs by 2030. So I'm gonna uh, shut up and say thank you, thank you, thank you for coming and um, take it away. All right. Recording in progress. Well, thank you for having us here today, Lisa, and thank you everybody for joining. Um, this is kind of be going to be a talk about electric vehicles on a very kind of rudimentary level and how it kind of plays in with obviously air pollution and then health. Um, so I encourage you guys to ask questions at any time. I love to be interrupted. Um, I don't like hearing myself talk. So um, I'm going to take the first portion of the presentation and then Melody will take the second portion and then we'll definitely have time for questions or comments at the end too. Um, so I am going to go ahead and start this. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay. So like Lisa said, um, we started the Michigan Electric Vehicle Alliance. It was several of us who started it. Um, Melody is definitely a founding member. And that was back in, uh, we've been around for almost two years now. So, um, and we are really pushing for legislation to make uh, a, a target goal, a goal date. We really stress that it's a goal, it's not a mandate for all new passenger and light duty vehicles to be electric. Um, there is a separate campaign, and some of you might have heard about it through the Ecology Center and a huge alliance with them um, and Charles Griffith, uh, really targeting like buses and trucks and fleets. Um, so they take kind of the bigger vehicles and we take the passenger everyday vehicle. Okay, so that's kind of the two separate um, air areas. Um, MEVA actually is in a joint campaign with the Ecology Center currently um, to push this legislation. So... Um, like you said, we're the Michigan Electric Vehicle Alliance. And so these slides are kind of more geared towards um, uh, just everybody, not just healthcare workers. So just kind of keep that in mind. So, um, so these are the main key players in our campaign. So me and Melody and then Rich and Charles. Charles is from the Ecology Center and Richard is a retired Presbyterian pastor actually. And he's super, super active in everything climate change. He goes to COP every year. He was just in Egypt for COP. I mean, he's kind of um, a, a standout in the climate world in Michigan. So we're gonna talk about what the current state of affairs is in Michigan, why this is important, our goals, um, our strategies and where people might fit in. So if you break down greenhouse gases by sector in Michigan, Transportation, um, and this is from 2020, this has changed just a little bit. Transportation has actually uh, surpassed electricity generation now. So transportation is about 29% currently. So it's the biggest piece of the pie, right? So we need to target the big piece of the pie so we make the biggest difference, right? Um, so some of these other ones, you can see electricity is the next one in line. Um, we're all aware. I mean, a lot of us just did the, um, the public comments for DTE's energy plan. So that's definitely the next one. Um, believe it or not, agriculture is not as big as I thought it was going to be in Michigan um, because we are kind of a farming state, but it's only about 10%. 
um, and then industry steel and stuff like that. So definitely transportation is the biggest piece, the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases in Michigan. When you break that pie back into just transportation and breaking that one out, this is kind of what you see. Um, and this is pretty up to date. So passenger and light duty vehicles are about 58%, okay? So again, if you wanna make the biggest difference, you target the biggest contributor, right? Um, so medium heavy duty trucks are definitely the next in line um, and then commercial aircrafts after that. So, but that's why we feel very passionate about targeting these two to make the biggest difference. Um, so we have this slide, it's just on recent news. I'll go through this really quickly. Um, this actually is a company, they're based out of Massachusetts called Ytricity. Um, they're one of the most focused companies on wireless charging for the everyday vehicle. So um, there's a lot of companies out there looking into wireless charging, but they are involved in a lot of other areas of electricity generation. So Ytricity is literally just looking at wireless charging for the everyday vehicle. Um, they actually, um, and Melanie can talk about this, but they actually just did a presentation this last weekend in Corktown in Detroit. And they had a Mach-E and they showed how it does wireless charging. So it's really cool technology. Um, it's not installed in vehicles yet, but they're looking to get that kind of out there. Um, so that's pretty cool. Everybody's heard of the IRA, right? This huge, crazy amount of money that's going towards climate change. Yes, Michigan's getting a part of that. Um, earlier on in the year, everybody's heard of the infrastructure bill, 110 million for Michigan, um, specifically towards charging stations. That's what that stands for. So um, Governor Whitmer is already kind of passing this out to certain projects, um, both in the private and public sector um, to get that ch the charging network kind of up, up, to, um, up to speed in Michigan. Um, this is a really fun thing. Melody and I actually attended the Woodward Dream Cruise this summer and Dodge introduced and unveiled the very first ever EV muscle car. Um, the thing about EVs, if you guys haven't been around them a lot or driven one is they're really quiet, right? Cause there's basically yeah. no moving parts. Yeah. So um, a lot of them actually, when they go under 25 miles an hour, they make a noise and it's a like generated noise that the car makes just for safety reasons. Um, so one of the biggest things they had to get around is, you know, muscle cars, people who drive these muscle cars love that noise. You know, you rev that engine and that's like, yeah, your muscle car. Well, EV muscle cars don't make any noise. So, um, they actually have a noise built into it. So when you rev the gas, not the, you know, the acceleration pedal, it does make a noise. Um, and it's actually pretty congruent with what you hear from a muscle car. It's a little bit different, so it's kind of funny the first time you hear it, but it's a really sexy, awesome looking car, honestly. So it, if you get a chance, and it's got a cool name too, I think it's called the, the Dodge Charger Daytona Banshee. So it's a pretty cool looking car. Anyways, um, these two things are really cool. For the first time ever, we actually have a federal tax credit for used EVs. It's up to $4,000 and the price of the EV has to be 25 grand or less. So we've never had tax credits for used EVs and because they're becoming more mainstream, lots more EVs that are used are coming onto the market. I think it's awesome, especially for, you know, the underprivileged, underserved population that we finally have this tax credit that we so, so need. Um, also in some of these bills, first time we get a federal tax credit for commercial vehicles. Um, and it's based on weight and a bunch of specifications, what the tax credit is, but that is a first um, this year. So I don't know if anybody of you, if you've kind of been following the tax incentives, they are gonna change a little bit in 2023. Um, it's still gonna be a max of 7,500, but they break it down into two separate areas, critical materials and then battery components. Um, this is a website, the Electrific Electrification Coalition, if you've never heard from heard about them, they are an excellent, excellent resource, not just on electric vehicles, but on a lot of things. Um, so they talk about fossil fuels. I mean, their website is just amazing. So if you ever want to check them out, they're a plethora of knowledge there. Um, but anyways, if you meet the requirements for these two separate things, then you will get $7,500. Um, the cool thing is previously, um, Tesla and GM had kind of 
hit the ceiling and you could no longer get a tax incentive for those two companies and that's being revamped. So there's a lot of things that come into play and actually there's new requirements on you know, your gross household income and a bunch of things, but um, it's opening up avenues for, for GM and Tesla to now get tax incentives, which is awesome. Lastly is advancements in bi-directional charging. If you hear about this, this V2G, it stands for vehicle to grid. You might also hear V2H, that's uh, vehicle to home. Um, the, the basic premise is, okay, we all know that a charging station can charge a car, but a if we have a car that's just sitting there, it should be able to lend electricity back to the grid if we need it. So it's kind of making cars batteries for our, for our electric, electricity grid. So it's really awesome. Um, they're starting to actually push for it into every vehicle. Most vehicles that are coming out on the market from about 2021 20, on um, do have this technology already built into them. So Amy, any way you can add that link to the uh, chat? Um, yes. I don't know if if Emily can do that, but um, at Does the end, I, slides? I, yeah, I can definitely do that. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go over several things of why this transition is so important. Um, the biggest thing that legislators like to hear about when we talk to them is what is it going to cost, right? Is it going to save people? Is it going to cost us money? That sort of thing. Um, it definitely costs money uh, or saves people money. So if you look at the average household, it's going to save them thousands of dollars, the average household in Michigan, by converting to an EV, just in gas money, literally just in gas money. So there is this conversion out there, it gets a little convoluted, but if you take an average EV, if you say it gets five mil miles per kilowatt hour, gasoline, obviously that changes. I don't know where it is where you guys live, but it's like $3 a gallon for me right now. The nice thing about EVs is electricity cost is pretty stable. That doesn't change. So for people who you know, are on very tight budgets, they can budget an EV cost daily way more they can than they can budget how much they're going to have to pay in gasoline daily. So that's one good thing. And then they're also going to save money. So, um, so if you do this conversion, an average EV will get 133 miles per gallon if you convert it out. Wherever an average ICE is about 25, some it's probably more like 28 now miles per gallon for average. Um, so if you look at, again, the savings, the average household will save about $2,500 a year. So it's pretty significant. Um, let's see. So let's talk about health, right? So these are some of the biggest things that we care about as Micah. Um, one of the biggest things I like to really hammer home because people just don't think about it is all the leaking from underground storage tanks around the state. So we know that storage tanks are leaking and not just gasoline, but lots of other things. But it's one of the main contributors of poisoning of our groundwater in the state of Michigan. And about 50% of Michiganders count on our groundwater for their drinking water. So this is poisoning people. I mean, literally it's poisoning people in Michigan. Um, so that's one of the biggest things. Once we transition to EVs, you no longer need these underground storage tanks. We can literally just get rid of them. So noise pollution, I kind of hinted about that earlier. Obviously, EVs are very quiet, so they get rid of noise pollution. Um, I've actually had two legislators who were Republicans and said, well, that's not good because then it's a safety issue. They didn't know that EVs under 25 miles an hour make a noise. Um, but noise pollution is linked to a plethora of chronic diseases, mental illness, sleep disturbance, poor work performance, and actually increased um, work production and missed days of work, um, definitely linked to cardiovascular disease too. So it's a huge contributor. So air pollution, that's a no-brainer, right? Everybody knows when you stand next to a vehicle, you smell the gas, obviously it's polluting our air. So hopefully all of us have heard of PM10 and PM2.5. These are the um, particulate matter that really get into, you know, our blood vessels through our capillaries and our lungs and just cause all sorts of havoc in our systems, right? Um, anything from lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, um, heart attacks, strokes, um, you know, asthma increase, COPD exacerbations, I mean, all these things. Um, 
This actually disproportionately affects children in the elderly. Children because, you know, their lungs are still um, developing, right? So when they're exposed to higher levels of air pollution, it's really bothersome. Um, so uh, let's see where else. Um, and then the elderly, because again, they have more cor comorbidities and they just don't have the reserve in their lung capacity to kind of filter all of that out. So air pollution is a big one. Um, and then another thing that a lot of people don't think about, but is the air pollution inside your vehicle. So when you're stopped at a stoplight or stuck in a traffic jam, the air pollution can get on average 29 times higher to 40 times higher inside the vehicle than it is outside of the vehicle. Um, so think about your kids sitting in your vehicle in a traffic jam. I mean, that's that's not good, right? So you're you're really breathing dirtier air um, when you're when you're using a gas powered vehicle, especially when you're in those situations where you're at a standstill. So further health effects, like I said, we talked about PM 2.5. It's the most dangerous Haley. element. Yeah, go ahead. Haley has a question. Oh, sorry. I don't have, I can't see people. You can't see. I know. That's why you're oh, there. Okay. I'll just jump in then. Um, yeah, go ahead. I just had a question about the noise pollution piece. So yeah. I completely understand the safety implications with, you know, noise being generated under 25 miles an hour. That makes sense. But when you were referring to the muscle car just making noise, like, you know, that I'm just pick, I'm literally, you know, I live really close to Fulton and I hear like engines rev revving literally all day and all night long. And it's, I always think about the noise pollution. Is there like a certain decibel that it just can't go over before it does become like a violation or how does that, I'm not really familiar with the noise pollution piece here. Yeah, I don't know about decibels. I mean, I work in ENT, so I should probably know that. But <laughs> um, as far as the muscle cars that have that kind of, you know, faux built in muscle car noise, um, I don't know enough about it if it's something that they have to push or when they push, you know, the acceleration pedal forcefully enough. I don't know what triggers that faux noise, to tell you the truth, in the new EVs. And that's the only one on the market. So it'd be, I mean, that's a good question. I can definitely look into that and get back to you. Um, no, that's okay. I'm just curious because I'm like, you know, noise pollution. I I feel like I'm just because I'm so close to such a thoroughfare that I, I actually am impacted by noise pollution regularly that like having that feature to me, because I'm not a muscle car person, like is a detriment, not a, like a, it's more of a, um, it's not a feature for me. Um, but obviously for people who want that, that is a feature. Um, it's just, it, that doesn't sound appealing at all that we're just now introducing noise pollution when we don't need to. Yeah, and there's definitely something to be said for that. Um, you would hope the people who buy that keep it like at the racetrack or something, you know, or areas where they just want to show it off, you know. Um, I have no idea how big the EV muscle car kind of, um, you know, is 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 it going to explode or is it not? I mean, who knows if it's going to be accepted widely or not. Um, when we went, Melody and I went to the Dream Cruise. Um, there was definitely a lot of skepticism. Um, you know, these people are diehard muscle car people, right? Um, and like I said, you can definitely tell the difference. It doesn't sound like a normal car revving its engine, right? So I don't know if that'll become a big issue, but you're right. I mean, they're, they're making noise when they don't really need to. They're doing it for their customers, basically, right? One thing so. that I have thought was very interesting, I'd be curious if you've kind of to segue from that, from your discussion about muscle collars, is that um, I know that there are some races uh, that are now occurring. I don't pay any attention. My husband watches go around, go around, or go around the races sometimes, but some of them are with electric vehicles and electric motorcycles, which he really loves. But um, I think seeing how competitive and how fast that they could go might make them more attractive. Do you know anything about that? Amy? 
Yeah, that's definitely one of the things that they're pitching. You know, the torque in an EV definitely gets you off the line way faster. Um, and I, I actually talked about that when I was talking to people at the Dream Cruise, but I don't remember what the stats are, but it definitely gets you off the line way faster. And so Dodge definitely hammers that home because sometimes when people are doing like their quarter mile on the racetrack, you know, getting off the line half a second, second faster is going to win for them. So yeah, that's definitely a thing. Um, I haven't personally seen any EVs in races, so I don't know how they do but they're definitely going to get off the line faster. I don't know if any of you have seen some of the EV commercials, but there's one out there that has this little dinky. It almost looks like a smart car. And I, I don't remember if it's a Chevy Bolt or Volt or it's a small EV and they show it in a downtown city coming up next to a Porsche. And it's basically a, a comic EV commercial. And it shows how, you know, this little EV pulls up to this Porsche and this guy's like revving his engine and everything. And so they take off and the EV definitely beats them off the line. <laughs> Oh, you know, long term, probably not in the quarter mile, but it beats it off the line. So, yeah. Thank you for your question. Yeah. If you just let me know, Lisa, because I'm on the screen, so I can't I can't see if people raise their hand. Yeah. Sure. I'm good at interrupting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. For sure. <laughs> so I kind of already talked about this PM 2.5. Um, it's smaller than it's it's less than a tenth of the diameter of a human hair. Um, gets down deep into our lungs, deep into our muscle tissue and causes chronic inflammation. So again, it's a known diagno uh, diagnosable risk factor for MI, stroke, lung cancer, asthma, all of these things. Um, they've actually done studies um, that it can increase tumor growth, which is really interesting. So this is an interesting little factoid that I found. Traffic jams equate to passive smoking. So for the average commuter in traffic for just one hour a day, it basically means you're passively smoking 180 cigarettes a year. Now, obviously that depends on, you know, where you're driving, if it's, if it's heavy air pollution already, but this is just taking average. I mean, and again, think of your children's health if they're in the car with you. Um, Air pollution kills more people worldwide per year than does AIDS, malaria, di uh, diabetes, and tuberculosis combined. So it's it's pretty significant. Um, and I know, I, I think Lisa's <laughs> made this factoid very prominent in a lot of talks, but the US spends about 820 billion per year to tackle health problems related to climate change in general. Um, again, further health benefits. This was a study that uh, Medicare did across a crossover study, 22 million deaths between 2000 and 2012, um, increased risk of all course, all cause, all cause mortality in the short term increases in uh, fine PM, so particulate matter. So you don't even have to be exposed to it long term. You can just have short, huge increases, and it increases your risk of all co all cause mortality. Um, so let's see here. I am going to turn it over to Melody. Thanks, Amy. Um, see, I'll take it over from the environment and um, I can speak personally um, from my end. Uh, where I live at, I live near uh, several plants. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Downriver, the Marathon plant. Um, that's where they process the gas and right under that is the old salt mine for the city of Detroit and it's just a like an industrial area. Um, it's polluted the air so much where we can feel it um, and me and my family suffer from asthma and uh, my son has diabetes and high blood pressure um, I'm dealing with. So it does uh, negatively affect us um, health wise. Um, but um, EVs will contribute to the improvement of our environment because there's no um, pollution from the gas, no engine combustion, no oil changes, no leaks from your transmission, um, the exhaust, uh, it cuts out all of that. Um, EVs are much cleaner, much more efficient. Um, and there are statistics that show that. Um, and that's another reason why I've joined MEVA. Um, I'm passionate about making a more sustainable, a cleaner, healthier environment for generations to come. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide. I can't, let me see. Um, is that the next slide, Amy? Okay. 
Um, there's, I don't know, there's something blocking it for me. I'll go over as much as I can from here. Okay, so it says the percent of manufacturing, um, Michigan is still motor vehicles and parts. Uh, the number one manufacturing is still here in Michigan. Uh, we, we do want to keep our nickname, the Motor City. Um, so we just need to convert to EVs 100%. Um, and that is our goal. Um, the next seven sectors added up still fall short of, I can see it, thanks still fall short of the amount of auto manufacturing. Um, and there's a website with more information here. Um, yeah, I can't see that. Uh, I may have to take over in my notes. Um, there's like a bar on my screen where I can't see the top part of the slide. Oh. I'll take over. Let me go to my Sometimes slide. You can, are you sharing your slides, Melody? Are you sharing um, your slides? No. I'm looking at Amy's slides. If I share mine. It's gonna take a minute to get to it. Well, okay, I have mine. Amy can keep hers up. I can have. I can use mine. Okay, whatever works. Sorry about that. Um, so it is true, um, according to Michigan uh, Kelly Blue Book reports, uh, Michiganders are buying more EVs. On um, in quarter two in 2021, uh, we're up 255 percent. Um, so that's a major difference. Um. Personally, I notice more of my neighbors are buying EVs. So um, my block is changing a little bit more each month. There's somebody new coming home with another EV. Um, Michigan, as a leader in USA for auto manufacturing, um, EV sector to ensure Michigan's economy doesn't falter and that we are at the forefront of Michigan, of automotive technology, I'm sorry and trends. Um, Senator Peters states this as a homeland security issue um, and dependence on China cannot continue to happen. China is beating us uh, with the EV sales. They are um, transitioning a little bit easier and faster than we are here in the USA. So we need to change that um, and bring the improvements home. Um, we are the state of the Motor City. We must maintain this status um, and lead our country. Um, let me see. China actually refines two thirds of the world's lithium and is the largest investor in lithium mines across the globe, according to the 2022 U.S. Geological Survey. So, our economy, um, a lot of EV jobs um, that haven't been invented yet. Um, so they're working on that with the Michigan, the Governor Whitmer's Task Force Initiative. Um, there's an infrastructure bill um, that's going toward creating more jobs. And if you watch the news every day, you'll see that they're opening plants here in the South e southeastern Michigan area and one in Lansing, they're going to open uh, a battery plant. So they are trans transitioning the workers as well, not just the sale of EVs. Um, and to make sure Michigan retains EV jobs, we'll have them, they'll have to invest in a charging infrastructure that will create jobs and also lead to more EV sales. And um, I just want to interject in that um, there's a, a circuit, uh, a charging circuit along the Lake Michigan um, coast um, in Western Michigan that has been, I'm not sure if it's two years now, but they're adding to it. Um, it's called the Lake Michigan EV circuit and Michigan Revolution for the Electrification of Vehicles on uh, my rev. Um, and it's, part of Michigan, um, Governor Whitmer's new Michigan economy. Um, the plan that focuses on growing the middle class, supporting small businesses and investing in our communities. So that's, um, as much as we promote in, in MEVA, as much as we promote in our events and our speeches and, and just educating legislators, we do have a supporting system um, with the state of Michigan, uh, as far as Governor Whitmer's task force, there's our big three, um, Ford, GM, and Chrysler. They're all working on their target dates. I think um, 2030, um, I don't know if that's Ford, GM 2035, and Chrysler, I'm not sure of theirs, but they all have target dates for 100% sale of EVs. So we do have um, information to rely on as far as uh, educating the legislators. Um, let me see, next slide, I'm sorry. Just a Global quick market growth. 
real quick, Melody, are those target dates, are they like closer to the 2030 timeframe or are they sooner than that? No, most of the target dates are 2030 or uh, further up like 2035, okay. um, 2038, just because it takes time. It costs a lot of money to transition um, their current factories and their processes. So they have to transition from the ice factories to the EV factories and set up battery plants. Um, the supply chain issue um, was a hindrance as well the last couple of years. So was, they didn't have the supplies they needed and the chip shortage um, really affected the car market. Um, so there were a lot of issues that the automotive industry had to work out before they can really set a date. So they were just um, not etched in stone, but they put a date out there, just an estimated date where they would um, commit to 100% EV growth and mo majority is 2030 or 2035. We know we don't have that much time, so they can't stretch it to 2050. That just is, is not feasible. Um, so the global market growth um, in comparison from 2020 to 2021, and these are old numbers, EVs are up in the USA 1%. Um, and we're still crawling and trailing behind other countries, but as technology advances and we make the changes needed, um, then we'll, we should be able to take the lead and, and we should, we're the motor city state. Um, Europe is, their EV sales are up 80%, China um, 97%, um, they're like kicking everybody's butt. But the consumer driven market, however, the rate of conversion from ICE to EV buyers is still far too slow. In 2021, the growth of EV sales did increase by 102% compared to 2020. So um, this still um, is still dragging behind uh, in comparison to other global markets. Um, so the more that we educate legislators and the population or the public, the more that they will see when we show them like the data and the numbers, um, we really need to beef up. Um, our campaign, uh, in which Amy mentioned earlier, our campaign with the Ecology Center, um, with the light duty and uh, heavy duty buses and trucks along with the cars. Um, and I also want to touch on, um, before um, I get to the end, um, my event um, with Y-Tricity this past weekend, it was very promising. And I used to be skeptical on EVs, and that's another reason I joined the Meva group, because I wanted to learn as much as I could. Their wireless um, technology, um, I wanna say it's the best. <laughs> I'm so glad I had a chance to go and visit them um, where they did a demonstration in the Ford Mach-E. Um, we all got to drive it. Uh, we got to charge it and see how it works. It's totally wireless and they don't use electricity. They use the, 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 the eons or something in the air. Um, and I'm not an engineering person, but they use the eons and they use that to charge. So it doesn't affect any cell phones charging, it doesn't affect any wireless connections. Um, if you have a, a pacemaker, it doesn't affect that. Um, so it's really um, smart technology that they're using. And while it's only available at the OEM level, um, they're going to, they're working on making it available or presenting it to individual buyers by the end of 2023. So um, it's not currently on the market yet and available for individuals, but it, it will be. Um, and we'll hear that in the news. Um, if you want more information, you can also visit their website, um, and I'll put that in the chat, but they do um, provide updates on where they are with installing and how um, soon it'll be available. So I'll share that um, before, um, I'll share that towards the end. So our, um, going back to the slides, our current global and national market shares on uh, VEVs compared to hybrids. Um, USA is, um, we're losing business. So 7.3%, um, the market share increase is only 1.1% between 2020 and 2021. Um, then you go all the way over to China, you see that they're 48%. Um, and lo locally in Norway, it's 90%. So um, we're still trailing um, and we're working, well, hopefully we'll catch up to that soon. Um, as manufacturers and, and the government, the infrastructure bill, we're working to improve our markets. Um, the next slide. Just a In quick public question, Melody. Do, yes. do, why do we think we're so behind? Like, is it just an education or is it so, like, just, you know, we obviously do have some subsidies in place for tax credits, but 
is it is it well, come down to education and people are there's a lack of awareness i think there's a several reasons why we're dragging one of them is um education and another um reason i would say are our resources um there was a there was a problem with the chip shortage um and i can get the information for you but i, I at one of my events in Saline this past summer, I was able to speak with um, a person. He didn't want to give his name. He worked for the government, uh, very high level uh, information. And he shared the fact that the reason why the chip shortage was occurring was because it's easy to hack. And um, other countries are hacking USA. They didn't want to install that chip in the cars and have other countries hack the data or the technology in our cars and cause an accident somewhere. Um, so they had to be really diligent and careful before they install the chip. So they're not only making it available for us to have our own factories over here with the chip production and the battery production, they're also securing our safety as well when they're doing that. So that's one reason. And another reason is just that people weren't ready. We're so used to our ICE vehicles and gas and, you know, it's like a cre we're creatures of habit. So when we get our gas from a gas station, we know how far we can drive until we have to gas up again. We know the dangers, what the limits are. So we're just creatures of habit and we're used to that. So we have to get used to um, making a change and for our environment um, because climate crisis is real and we're seeing it every day in the weather. So that's- you probably have that's to make it a of reasons. Yeah. You probably have to make it sex. Hey, Chuck, how are you? You got a question too. Hey, good to yeah, see good to see you. I, I was on, we, I was having breakfast, so I didn't want to. <laughs> oh, no problem. Just so glad you're here. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, a couple of questions and sort of in, in response to what you're saying right now, too. I mean, one of the questions I have is, has anybody, is anybody aware of like battery length differences between warm and cold climate? Like we live in northern Michigan. Um so one of uh, my wife and I have been talking about maybe transitioning to an EV at some point in the next uh, you know short time. I mean that's part of the problem I we see is what is our battery length difference, and then also uh, the lack of you know potential charging <laughs> opportunities if we want to go visit kids in North Carolina or in New York. Well, I don't think the hot or cold makes a difference. It's the technology um, and how well it is. Um, so I've been told by <laughs> I've been, do you have a question? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You're muted, Cheryl. I'm sorry, I am the owner of an all electric uh, Chevy um, Bolt and I wanna tell you the cold weather makes a huge difference in terms of the, the range. Um, so that is- Is it like the original? Can I ask, is it the original Bolt? No, uh, Bolt. The Bolt is a hybrid. Uh, gas and electric and is no longer in production. We have one of those okay. too, but okay. I have the Bolt, which is, um, you know, 100% um, electric and my range goes way down in colder weather, way down. It's it's significant. Okay. And I, I do know that initially when that technology came out, that was an issue, but they have improved it since then. So the new technology that came out, um, the weather does not affect it as much. Um, and there's also more charging stations. Um, as you drive along, they're installing more. And there's an app on your phone um, that lets you know, there's a few apps that gives you the locations of those charging stations. So they're improving things every quarter or every year, as you mind. So um, they were aware of that issue in the beginning. So. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know, I have a 2019 bolt. And the other thing is, um, the heating in the winter uh, really sucks the energy uh, as well. So I don't know, I hope things have changed a lot since 2019, but I, I just, that's my experience, so. <laughs> I'll see if I can find some information and put it in the chat, but um, I've been speaking to people like since the summertime at different events. And that's one thing that the manufacturers have worked on and improved on because they were aware that the hot and the cold and on the original or the previous batteries uh, were affected by that weather change, so. Um, I know that they have improved it. I'll just have to find the website so you can go to to find that information. Um, That's really helpful. Thank you so the, much for helping their, you know, economy um, and buying an EV. Is Cheryl, do you have another question, or was 
do you still have your no that was it okay good thanks so much melody go ahead okay um, um i just have a couple of more slides and then i'll be done i know we're supposed to be done uh soon so i'll speed it up a little so public opinion in michigan as a polls or surveys were taken is global warming happening only 69 percent said yes so everybody was not on board and they don't believe global warming is happening um, is global warming caused by mostly human activities? 57% said yes. And will global warming harm future generations? 70% said yes. And we can see that as we watch the news with uh, the more increasingly um, forest fires and the really, really damaging storms, they get stronger every year uh, with the hurricanes and the um, when the tectonic plates crash and you have all those um, those ocean storms, I'm sorry, I'm losing a brain part right now, but the ocean storms and the tornadoes, we have far, far more activity going on than we did a few decades ago. Um, so yeah, it's happening, it's real. Uh, would you support legislation that requires all new passenger vehicles to be electric by 2030? Only 55% say yes. So we still have, Emeva still has our work cut out for us in terms of educating legislators. Um, and just population in general. So uh, would this legislation have positive impact on air quality? 76% said yes. Um, we are in fact working, our end goal is to have legislation in place to make EVs more accessible, to have EV, um, the whole um, industry be more inclusive to include everyone. Next poll, uh, would this legislation have a positive impact on individuals' health? 62% said yes. Um, I'm one of those yes people. It will impact uh, positively on everyone's health. And as Amy had explained it before, um, right now we're suffering as far as um, asthma, um, respiratory illnesses, um, all of that will um, decrease as EV sales go up. And we'll see that in the numbers um, going forward. Um, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, Myths versus Facts about EVs are listed on their website. So if you want more information on that, you can go to www.epa.gov. Um, so I'm moving to the next slide. Benefits of electric vehicles. Um, it's kind of scary, but it, it's, I like it. No air and noise pollution. They are extremely quiet. So um, people who are walking, who are in parking lots, you you will have to be more aware of where you are and what's around you. They are very quiet, um, but they're very clean and efficient too. Um, safety and automation, um, people driving EVs had less injuries prepared, uh, compared to ISIS in study by IIHS over a nine year period. So there are studies uh, that have been out there for years and it, is tracking the progress. Um, efficiency, average ice uh, has 17 to 21% of gas um, and is converted to energy at wheels, where the EV is 59 to 62% of electricity converted to power at wheels. So saving money, not only cheaper is it to buy an EV and maintain it, um, it's cheaper to power, but yearly cost is, is, is way cheaper than owning an ice. Um, in 2018, University of Michigan did a study and found that EVs cost less than half as much to operate than an ICE vehicle. Less moving parts and parts that require maintenance, oil changes, um, engine um, exhaust, um, all of that goes away with an EV. The current um, initiatives, and I mentioned earlier, Michigan, um, the governor, Governor Whitmer has a task force that covers all of that. Um, as mentioned before, there's the Lake Michigan EV circuit. Um, and if you haven't, um, if you're nearby in the area, go check it out. Um, I heard it's amazing. Um, governor Whitmer also um, has an advanced uh, uh, initiative to advance Michigan's EV infrastructure and workforce landscape. So she's adding the tools, the resources, the jobs, and a charging circuit. Um, it's all very promising. So, um, my next slide. Current initiatives in the United States. New Jersey um, has an executive order with the goal of 2035, um, the $5,000 credit per vehicle. Massachusetts uh, has a target goal of 2035 EV sales. 
um, within the 2050 decarbonization roadmap. Uh, Rhode Island, uh, they have legislation introduced. California, they have an executive order with a goal of 2035. In Oregon, they have a Senate bill um, with major tax incentives. Um, there's only one state um, that I know of, and that's Washington, the state of Washington, and they've passed legislation into law as of March of this year um, with the goal of 2030 EV sales. So um, Michigan, once again, is trailing with that. We haven't had any leg legislation passed, um, but that is one of our goals that we're working on at, with MEVA, within MEVA. Um, next slide, our automotive capital. Um, General Motors, um, as of January 2021, GM CEO Mary Barra announced a bold plan to phase out gas and diesel power vehicles by 2035. So that's their goal. Um, in January, um, they announced, well, GM announced that it plans to be carbon neutral by 2040. So they, they moved the years up. Ford um, has promised to um, be carbon neutral by June, sorry, 2035. And um, we'll see how that goes. Um, I don't have Chrysler's information here yet. Um, next slide. So EV sales doubled in the United States in 2021. The U.S. Department of Energy reports that there were 10,620 registered EVs in Michigan as of December 31st, 2020. Um, and there's obviously more since then. Um, according to the data from the Michigan Secretary of State, at the end of 2021, the number of EVs in Michigan was up 58% um, statewide. So it is growing year by year. It's just trailing um, a little bit too far behind than what our um, that what we would favor. Um, so our goal, um, our goal, um, it's not etched in stone, um, is to increase EV sales across Michigan to 100% on passenger and light duty vehicles um, by 2030. Um, there's already buses and trucks. Um, City of Detroit has purchased, I wanna say six as of now, electric buses. So they are working to increase that fleet of the EVs um, Meyer stores just announced on the news yesterday that they have purchased semi trucks to make its delivery statewide. Um, so they are working on increasing their EV fleet as well. And they've already begun the transition. So um, it's very promising. People are catching on and they are taking it seriously now, um, like we would rather than do. So we have strategies to meet our goal. Uh, we yeah, want the I don't think we need to go into that though, Melody, if you don't want to. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> no, yeah. um, okay, I'll skip that because I know we're limited on time. And how can we work together? Um, so you can join MEVA. You can help us on our goals and we'll fill you in. We have meetings twice a month, every other Wednesday at 6 p.m. Um, there is a introduction and support to legislation that we're working on, um, supporting green infrastructure, um, support our public education campaign, and support tax incentives for businesses and or consumers. So um, those are different ways that we can work together. Um, the time, okay, I'm here, I'm approaching the end here. So again, our goal, our target goal is 100% sale of EVs, of passenger and light duty vehicles in Michigan by 2030. Um, wish it can be sooner, but 2030 is as soon as uh, maybe is reasonable. Um, once again, it's not etched in stone, but that is our target goal. Let's pass it. Let's surpass it. That's a great goal. Yeah. And the work that you, work you guys are doing is just awesome. And MEVA has gone out of their way to be supportive of collaborative groups. They've highlighted MICA several times. They're doing amazing work. And I guess one thing I'm really hopeful about <clears throat> is in terms of passing legislation right now on a state level, you know, we are in a great position because uh, we, the, we have sympathetic leaders uh, and they are um, in the majority now in the House, the Senate and the executive suite. So it's time for us to get going on this. Does, does anybody have questions for Melody and Amy before we close out today? This great discussion, you guys, and great work. Very nice. I just wanted to, oh, go ahead. Nice. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I see a question in the chat. Does Miva partner with car dealerships? 
Um, as of now, we have not partnered with any car dealerships, although we have spoken to some of the employees that work there. We do pass out our flyers and we invite them to come to our meeting to learn more about what we do. But as of now, um, we don't have any direct relationship with any car dealers. Um, That's a really good do, idea. Yeah, we do coordinate sometimes at our events. And this is like a new partnership with the Tesla owners of Michigan. Um, so they have agreed to help us on a lot of our events and, and our speaking engagements um, to come out with their cars and educate the public by giving them a hands-on experience of how EVs work and how they drive. So. That's nice. That's great. Okay. So Amy had something, Larry had something, and uh, Chuck had something. Was Chuck, was it a question or were you just making a statement? Oh, I, I was just making a statement. Nice, nice presentation by both nice. of you. Nice. Thank you. Amy, um, did you want to add something or should we go to Larry for his question? Well, I wanted to speak to Larry's email that he sent me last night. Um, Thank you. So when you're talking about efficiency of electric vehicles, we kind of covered that, right? They're way more efficient in the conversion of energy. So, you know, you're getting that efficiency boost. They're also way cheaper, but he had a specific question about, you know, the lifetime carbon emissions of an electric vehicle versus an ice powered vehicle. Eight to 10 years ago, there wasn't a huge difference. It was still significant. It was about 20 to 25%. And we're talking from manufacturing to transportation to disp disposal of the vehicle. Now it's between 60 and 68%. A lot of that is because harvesting the materials out of the ground is getting greener. Um, batteries are improving, the technology of batteries. And we're getting more renewable energy. So we're powering our cars more off of renewables than we were fossil fuels. So we're hoping that percentage continues to climb. But to answer the question that Larry asked me, EVs are definitely greener, better for the environment by only <coughs> compared Sorry. to their gas counterpart. Did you but have ahead, more of a question, Larry? I hope this doesn't take much time. Uh, the, the question is, what's the source of the superiority? So um, for, a, for a standard uh, internal combustion engine car, um, it burns gas in the engine with a certain efficiency um, and delivers the power to the wheels. For a uh, electric car, it, uh, if, you, if, you, if, if it's powered by electricity from your um, utility burning natural gas, it burns the fossil fuel in a turbine, converts it to kinetic energy at the generator, which makes it into electricity, which transmits it over power lines, which uh, uh, charges your battery, which converts the energy to kinetic energy in your car. There's extra steps involved in the electric car. And how does it more than make up for those, elect for those extra steps to be a more efficient thing? It, it, it must be that the turbines that burn fossil fuel are are more efficient than the piston engine piston and engines in cars. Either that or something about gasoline being a um, more efficient, less efficient source of energy than than natural gas, say. Well, if you're talking efficiency, I mean, batter, the batteries going into the car, definitely a uh, higher efficiency conversion into energy at the wheels than than gas, than fossil fuels. Um, so I'm not an engineer. I just know what the studies have shown right. that, you know, the lifetime greenhouse gas emission, and they've done, you know, a, tons of studies kind of looking into this, um, especially in Europe, some in the U.S., but especially in Europe, um, looking at the entire greenhouse gas, you know, emission uh, lifetime cycle of the vehicle. Um, some of it, I think, is on the even on the Electrification Coalition's website, but um, I know that holds true. Like I said, they're about 60 to 68 percent um, less greenhouse gas emissions over the life cycle. But okay. when you're talking turbines and all that kind of stuff, I mean, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know what to yeah. say about that. I want to compliment both of you, not only for your presentations, but for taking on this uh, superb volunteer effort. I'm, I'm way impressed. Thank you. Thank you very wholeheartedly. Cheryl, you had a question? You're muted again. <laughs> uh, hi, can either of you comment on, um, you, you know, one of the cons of EVs that I've, I've read about are the um, rare elements that are necessary for battery production and the mining and, um, 
you know, um, the environmental damage from that mining and, and environmental injustice, you know, for certain communities in the US and, and elsewhere in the world. So if, if you could just comment on that. And then number two, I don't know if you talked about this, I got, I, I got pulled away. But, um, you know, one of the um, things that um, I, I think prevents people from going gung ho with EVs is the charging times, even though they're they're improving besides the lack of um, stations. Um, any comment about where that technology is going and what we can hope for in the future? I mean, there's a difference between stopping for gas and it takes five minutes and stopping and taking even 20 or 30 minutes, let alone 45 minutes. So. Those are my questions. Thank you. Yeah, so about the charging stations and then Melody, whatever you want to say, I'll, I'll let you fill in. Probably I have a lot of holes too for you to fill in. But um, <laughs> so the charging stations, the average commuter drives about 60 to 80 miles a day. So if you charge your car at night, you do not need to charge during the day. So that's a non-issue. If you're going on a road trip, then like Melody said earlier, there's apps in your phone where you can tell exactly where charging stations are on your on your map, you know? Um, Tesla has its own, uh, its own technology, but actually starting this month and going into next year, um, Tesla is opening up their technology to all manufacturers. So you will need a converter, but those rapid charging stations that are all over the place are now gonna be and that's kind of inside information that I have. So don't spread that until it's okay. actually advertised publicly. That, that but, um, is wonderful news. Yeah, they <laughs> are going to be opening up. So they're opening up in New York first as kind of a test for a month. And then if all goes well, they're going to open it up nationwide. So that's mm -hmm. going to be a huge bump in the amount of charging stations that are, you know, that can charge all the different cars. But yeah, so the level three charging stations are the best, right? So those are the ones that can charge your car in 15 minutes or less. Yes, it's a little bit more than the five minutes, but you know, if you're going on a road trip, then you wait 15 minutes and hopefully that technology will continue to improve. So most of them, we're really pushing for only level three chargers to be installed going forward. You know, they're still installing some level two, but we're pushing for just level three. Right, and for, for just data, and I get the information for you, you can drive further on a charge than you can on gas, um, like 100 and something miles as opposed to 25 miles per gallon. Um, it just depends on how long you leave your car charging before you leave and how many stops you'll have to make, what the distance is between your start and your end um, target um, or your location. Um, so the, the plug-in chargers are what's being offered now. Amy was saying the level threes are better. The wireless charging um, option, it's um, still being worked out at the OEM level, it's a level two. And you pull up and you press the button, you don't have to plug in anything. So the charging will not be disturbed. You can literally turn your car off, get out, go shopping and come back and maybe, you know, half hour, hour or so and your car is charged. So you don't have to sit there with it plugged in. So there's a couple of options now um, to help that um, go a little smoother, keep you a little safer. You don't have to sit in the car with it. So I know some people, it, we're about seven minutes after, if people have to leave, please know how much I appreciate each of you for being here. I appreciate our speakers. Um, Kaylee still has a question and we can stay on for those who are interested, very welcome to stay on. But uh, if you have to leave, we understand and stay with us because 2023 for MICA should be a great year. And um, we've got a lot of energy, we've got a lot of momentum, and uh, we need each of you here. So thanks to each of you. And then, um, Haley, did you want to, for those who want to yeah. stay, stay? I, Amy, do you have to go back to work? No, it's fine. I can wait. Melody, you're okay? Yep, yeah, I'm fine. Okay, Haley, go. I just have one quick question, because I am going to be in the market for a new vehicle in the very near future. Is there like a one-stop shop for like what you need to know, white page or like, you know, uh, uh, some type of resource that you could point me in the direction to for all things purchasing a electric vehicle, like, char you know, literally, I'm just thinking of like, I would love to know um, charging times, like different types of vehicles out there that are electric, the um, charging stations in the state of Michigan, 
the tax credits that are available. Like literally if I, there was just like a resource that could say, okay, if you're a consumer in the market, here's everything you need to know to purchase your electric vehicle and, you know, have at it, you know, no, no convincing needed. Like I want, I, that's what I would like to purchase. I just don't know what is all available to me and, and how it all works. So it, I don't know if there is that, if that exists, if not, I would potentially be interested in helping create something like that with you guys. Amy, um, I guess you can interject out. I'll say that, you know, just from what I've encountered with the, our work, there's several different resources and websites you have to go to. I don't think it's all in one place and one location. Um, the first thing you would want to do is probably look to see what kind of vehicle you want. And then um, once you make your decision, um, find out what type of charger you would need. Then go to um, the dealerships will have this information. Uh, but if you weren't too sure, go to like the state website, like for state of Michigan, you would um, just maybe go to Google and, and type in incentives for EVs. There's um, a website for with the state of Michigan, it'll take you to where the incentives are and it'll show you what the state <coughs> incentives are. And also <coughs> it'll take you to the um, the federal website where their incentives are listed. Um, but once again, the dealerships will have that information for you as well. Um, as, far, as far as like any myths that you need to research and follow up on, um, the Environmental Protection Agency website would be a good place to start with those. Um, they debunk a lot of the myths. Um, and they answer a lot of your questions and, and provide, they do provide comfort um, once you do make a decision and like, well, what about the weather? Does it affect the battery or um, is it safe to charge, you know, my car? How long will it take? Do I, just different questions that you will have. The EPA has the answers on their website. So I will start there. Um, and then as you go along with your questions, you know, is there a maybe owners group like Tesla has a um, I think it's each state but they do have Tesla owners um, for for instance of Michigan where they all get together um, and they have like a social media page and you get to meet them they have events um, they share where all the charging stations are they share their experiences you know anything that goes wrong with them if they do go wrong and then things you know that they find that are a big benefit and why they own Teslas for example um, or any other EV that you're looking into, like the Chevy Volt, there are some people out there that are strong. Um, they are strong supporters of a Chevy Volt. Um, so it just depends on what you want to buy. But there's, mm, I don't think there's a one-stop shop for just buying EVs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, and again, I hate to keep pushing this one place, but if you go to the Electrification Coalition's website, they are like a huge resource for EVs. Um, and they actually have a link right there. And it, the link was in my um, presentation. I don't know if it got into the chat. Well, but we, if we don't have your your slides, we can't put it in. And so okay. I think you have the slides. So okay. if one of the two of you could copy them and put it in the chat, then we, there it is. Okay. You, there had, go. you had the copy of the slides, Em? Yeah. So if you, you go didn't... to their, yeah, if you go to their website, they actually have a link that um, will tell you all about the tax incentives. Cause if you're gonna buy next year, tax incentives, you know, it it does get a little confusing going into next year. Um, I will say, figure out what kind of technology you want first. That's the first thing I would ask myself. Do you want a really techie car? Cause if you do, that's gonna be a Tesla. Do you want something that is a little bit more economical? Maybe not as expensive. It's probably gonna be one of the other, other brands. Um, but yeah, that's a good place to start. That's a big Thank help, you. Amy. Thank you. Yeah. And the other thing I just want to plug is that Rewiring America IRA calculator I put in the chat. That goes over, that tells you how much money you can get, you personally can get uh, based on your income and your um, and your zip code for like an induction stove or an EV or you know, solar or whatever, that's, you know, it's much broader than a, than the work Amy and Melody are, is doing. But if we don't start implementing and people are un unaware of it, then we won't realize the IRA benefits. So that's, that's just something to tell people about. Yeah, just keep in mind that that's probably 2022s. So if you're going to buy next year, it's definitely going to change. Um, the one last thing I want to say about that, Kaylee, specifically is in our research and going around and talking to dealerships, a lot of the people, the, the car sales people, 
are not really educated on EVs. So oh. they have the pamphlet or they just direct you to their website. So do your due diligence and learn about it yourself because we've had to go out and teach some of the car salesmen. I mean, I have in my community, I went and test drove a Kia Nero and they knew nothing about the car. I wow. knew a hundred percent more than they did about the car before I showed up. So I, oh, I can, I can testify to that. The, the first car dealership I went to when I knew I wanted to buy an EV, the guy, the D, the dealer actually discouraged me. He's like, yes. I would want one of those, I, I, you know, and if I were a less savvy consumer, <laughs> I might've been discouraged, you know? So yeah, I had the right. same experience at the Kia really? dealership where I went and he's like, you know, you might have issues with charging. And I didn't tell him any of my background, you know, <laughs> and then I had flyers with me and I said, actually, <laughs> and so I had a really nice conversation with him, but just, you know, you might get false information even from dealerships, so which is really sad. And that's why we're doing a lot of public education. That's so. so important. So important, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. It's yeah. just incredible. 